It started with a tattoo, a tattoo of a flower, or part of a flower. She came with a photograph, but it was no flower he had ever seen before. She wanted it here, she said, pointing to her navel. She wanted it surrounding what she considered the most important part of her body. She also wanted the exact same shade of color. Since she was chocolate brown, he, the tattooist, had to play a little bit with the mixture. When they were both satisfied with what, they, what he came up with, the tattooist wrote the combination of inks and dyes into a book so he would always remember. He knew that she would be coming back many times thereafter. As he readied the electric machine, the tattooist explained that the ink would be inserted into her skin through a series of needles, that it would be over before she knew what was happening. Still, there would be some stinging and burning and a slight swelling. He made sure that she saw the gloves he was wearing, that he opened up a brand new pack of needles and wet disposable napkins. There were no risks of any kind of infection. To make small talk as he took her clothes off, the tattooist told the young woman that though it was hard to tell, he knew she was a foreigner. Well, not a foreigner exactly, for who could really claim to be a native New Yorker? But there was a soft lilt to her voice, an accent that was somewhat muffled. Such thick, dark hair, he thought, admiring the young woman, the dark, almost to violet eyes. As she lay on the raised, narrow bed, he gave her what he thought was the beginning of the very center of a flower. He noticed how, after they were finished, she stared at herself for the longest time in front of the mirror. She came back a few weeks later with another photo. This one showed even more parts of the pale pink flower. Though he could not see all the plant, he instinctively knew that this was a flower that bloomed profusely. He saw the five petals that were beginning to flare from a yellowish center. Could he do this? She asked softly. Could he enlarge her flower? She lifted up her blouse so he could admire the work he had already done, that first tattoo forming a ring around the rumpled dark spot of her navel. How well everything had healed, such vibrant colors. As he mixed a new batch of colors, he, she told him that she was from Jamaica, that she hadn't been home for such a long time she could barely remember the outline and contours of the island, and she didn't really feel right in calling the island her home. The tattooist smiled to himself. He remembered the time years before when he had fallen hard for an island beauty. Every time he thought of that woman, she was conflated into a vividly colored flower. That day, he extended the pale pink color halfway across the young woman's belly. The next time the young woman came, she wanted to round out the edges of the petals to a magenta color. She wanted the sepals curling slightly. She wanted streaks of white mixed in with the magenta. The flower was now extending upwards to cover almost half of her body. When he was done, she kept looking at herself in the mirror, all the while mumbling larger and no larger. He would keep working on her until the image started touching a rigid, dark nipple. The tattooist liked, liked working on this woman's body. How effortlessly the needle sank into her skin, as if, as if it were the very best crushed velvet. How she sighed every time she felt the piercings, almost as if it were released to have something enter her body painfully. She wanted to tell him all the things that she knew about the custom of tattooing. Something of what he said about modification and especially branding seemed to please her immensely. Then she asked him if it was true that the ink might fade one day in the faraway future. She seemed overly relieved at his answer that yes, the tattoo would fade, but no one could ever totally remove it from her body. When he said this, a calm, relaxed look came over her. The next time she came, she wanted lance-like dark green leaves to go with the flower. She had done some research, she said, had found out that many people erroneously believed the flower to be a member of the olive family. She could understand why. The leaves they, they, grew, they grew looked so much like each other. 
Indeed, the night before, she had dreamt that she was applying olive oil all over her body. But no, this wasn't some olive plant imitation flower. Anyone with any kind of sense would know that just because two things, two people looked alike, that did not necessarily make them family. Family. In the soft lilt of her voice, she repeated the word over and over, even as he worked on the soft, velvety, velvety canvas of her body, extending the flower to her back, then down her arms and legs. But then, the woman with the burnt sienna here had taken him aback when she told him she was working as a helper. He had had her pinned down as someone's spoiled, rebellious daughter. But no, she told him, the work she was doing was as a housekeeper. Still, she must be paid handsomely, this woman who kept adding more and more parts of the strange and exotic flower to her body, for she never had any problem paying him what he charged, and he knew he charged more than any of the other tattooists in the city. They must be some very rich people she worked for. A couple of weeks later, she told him that the couple she worked for looked just like her, had in fact the same warm brown color. Did he remember what she had said to him before about people looking exactly like you not necessarily being your family? They were both lawyers, this couple who she worked for, with a thriving practice somewhere in midtown Manhattan. She was lying on the flat, narrow bed, and this time she wanted even more branches and leaves added to the now gigantic flower that was consuming, it seemed to the tattooist, her slim young body. After a while, it did not seem right to him that this flower just kept growing and growing up and down her arms and legs, her back, breasts, belly, and even surrounding her pubic area. Was the flower sucking the life out of this once vibrant young woman? She seemed weak and tired when she came to see him. It was then she told him she was but a child when she had left, had been taken from Jamaica, and never, not once, had she set foot on or been allowed to go back to the island. Yes, she had said in a hiss of a voice that could not hide her anger. There had been a few letters over the years from a woman who claimed to be her mother, but this woman only ever wrote her when she wanted something, only ever wrote to beg her money. But she was finished with that now, the young woman busy turning herself into a flower was saying, all she cared about these days was the style and the stigma of her flower, its filaments and anthers. Another day, she started telling the tattooist a new story, which at first seemed to him a far-fetched hallucinatory tale, except that she told it with so much detail and vigor, of a little girl who had been given away by her mother, how this eight-year-old girl had been handed over. The, the tourist, whom she called terrorists, had come to the island on a visit, but had ended up taking the frightened little girl with them back to America. All the promises they had made to this little girl's mother, how they would send her to school in America, how she would grow up to be a big time doctor. The young woman told the tattooist how her mother had whispered in her ear that she was to go with these people, these strangers, and the little girl was to do what these people told her to do. They were her parents now. When the little girl started crying, her mother shushed her and told her to think of the other children. The little girl would never forget the thick wad of American dollars handed over to her mother by her new tourist terrorist parents, and that her mother barely had time to say goodbye to her because she was so busy counting the money. The things this couple did to the little girl child from Jamaica how for years she was never allowed to leave the house without one parent or another with her, even as she got much older. How it was that they, her parents, who kept handing her the begging letters from Jamaica, also kept insisting that there was no place called Jamaica. The couple told her that her memory of a life on an island so many years before was all part of an overblown imagination the same imagination that her, had landed her on the psych ward one time after another for making up stories about such good people. For years, she could not sort out the truth of one story from the fiction of another. The tattooist listened without saying a word when she told how one, then the other, 
and sometimes both together, the couple enjoyed her. Not only enjoyed her, but made of her a cardboard character, filming and photographing her, sharing her with friends who eagerly came over, calling her this horrible name, Lolita. And when the tired, weakened girl left him that day, the tattooist had no choice but to trawl the internet until he found a picture of a hardy pink plant called the oleander, a plant that the young woman said grew in abandon in the yard of a lean-to, tin-roofed house of a bedraggled woman with too many children around her. After he found the plant, he sat looking at it for the longest time, the tattooist, knowing instinctively that this would be the last time he would see her. Thank you.